Well, it's good to uh, start off on a tune like that. And uh, the, the theme for our discussion this afternoon is on the board there, can we save souls while serving suffering humanity? And uh, the same uh, procedure, same procedure as last year, James, as we say, same procedure as in the morning, we do it in now. We listen to the two papers, the two response papers, and then we discuss in the groups. And uh, the presenters are aware of the time limit and uh, that uh, we will walk the card of five minutes and then we'll walk the card of two minutes and then we will all walk out okay. if you continue. So uh, let's hope for the best. But uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce Captain Andy Miller from USA a Southern and he will uh, give us his paper. Let's welcome Andy Miller. I readily admit as I begin that I'm a core officer and I am a preacher, which is very different from delivering a paper. So uh, you might just sense in a way I, I'm a little bit out of my element here. And about halfway through the paper, I just might have a call to the mercy seat. So who knows? Just be ready. Be on your, I'll do my very best to stick to what is written. But I'm, I'm honored to be here and thankful for the opportunity to make this presentation. So I think you all have my paper, and we'll you'll likely follow along. We look forward to interaction later. Can we save souls while serving suffering humanity? Well, language drives the way we actualize what we discern to be God's movement in the world. Some are undoubtedly hearing this paper in a language that is not native to them. Conceptualizing the theme of this conference, the power of one army transforming our world, means for me that we not only have to work to understand one language, but also to recognize I have to recognize my cultural perspective as a Salvation Army officer in the USA South. So this paper seeks to answer the question, can we save souls while serving suffering humanity? And I will approach this question from a historical and theological perspective with the aim my aim is to recover an ancient biblical practice that can refresh Salvation Army ministry. Despite the barriers of language and different perspectives, I want to give an unequivocally clear answer to the given question. My answer to the question above is exuberant, yes! I guess I could be done now. Yes, we can. The answer to this question seems simple, but the fact that it necessitates discussion reveals a tension that exists with, within Salvation Army theological praxis. Navigating this tension is essential to actualizing God's kingdom through the ministry of the Army. So I take on the focus then first through historical lens, what I call the theological engine of the Salvation War. In July 1865 in London's East End, an opportunity came for Reverend William Booth to preach a series of revival meetings, which marks the genesis of what we know and love as today as the Salvation Army. Booth's heart ached for the people of this area. He illustrated this passion, saying, In every direction were multitudes, totally ignorant of the gospel, and given up to all kinds of weak wickedness. A voice seemed to sound in my ears. Why go anywhere else to find souls that need the gospel? Here they are, tens of thousands at your very door. Preach to them the unsearchable riches of Christ. I will help you. Your need shall be supplied. The people of their mission field, particularly London's East End, were ravished by extreme poverty. Due to this, the Salvation Movement was bound to respond to the greater social problems on its battlefield. Reflecting on this historical movement that embraced a holistic theology of ministry, it seems that eschatology, both personal and universal, was the theological engine of the Salvation Army. All the work of the Salvation Army was done in light of the final end, eschaton, hence eschatology. To achieve its desired end, i.e. the salvation of souls and the eminence of Christ's millennial reign, the Salvation Army had to dramatically engage the culture that surrounded it. They could not possibly work in the midst of people who were struggling within poverty and social oppression for long with a singular focus on souls without re recognizing the necessity that social and physical problems needed salvation as well. The Salvation Army operated more functionally or pragmatically than theoretically and probably still does. The great goal of the Salvationist mission is an eschatological aspiration. 
Booth and the early army desired, with the help of God, to save the soul of every person in the world. This primary desire to save souls is, I'm saying, an eschatological concern. Before the army institutionally organized a global strike against social evils, such ministry, ministry was anticipated in the 1880s. And boy, I wish I had time to talk about that further because it's been the source of uh, much scholarly disputes. But I will go on. This movement found its theological climax, not in William Booth's and Darkest England, The Way Out, but in his article, Salvation for Both Worlds. This famous ar article published in 1889 is the articulation of a conclusion that Booth had reached, resulting from his recognition of the necessity of holistic ministry. This proclamation was not an overnight decision. It was rather a mature theological expression that understood social and spiritual aspects of the Christian message. This holistic theological development was articulated in 1890 with the establishment of the Social Wing, a division of the Salvation Army ministry that sought to implement the scheme expressed in In Darkest England and the Way Out. In Darkest England explicitly supported and then institutionally expanded the existing social ministry of the Salvation Army that had been operating since 1884. It's hard to ascertain if the same theological foundation has accompanied the Salvation Army after the death of William Booth. Professor Ed McKinley, perceptive historian of, Salvation Army, of the Salvation Army, suggests this of the rank and file workers of the Salvation Army. I think this is very helpful. They, the rank and file workers, were little concerned with theories of social justice. They knew only that their heavenly commander had ordered his soldiers to take in strangers, visit the sick and imprisoned, and offer drink to the thirsty and food to the hungry. They also knew that they, there were souls dying all around, and that the first step in saving them, some of them was to lift them up so they could hear that such a thing as salvation existed. What was impressed upon the Salvation Army by William Booth was a holistic theology that was developed by his own eschatological vision and the way he felt God was using his army in that process. It's unlikely that one would hear a contemporary Salvationist articulate an eschatological theology for holistic ministry in the Salvation Army. What we would hear is a consistent approach towards a missional theology that values God's ability to redeem every part of the world and the soldier's responsibility in the great Salvation War. William Booth's eschatology produced a passionate care for individuals, a dynamic millennial spirit, a missional ecclesiology, a powerful social ethic, and a clear doctrinal basis for these beliefs. The impact of this ecclesiology is felt today in the way the Salvation Army lives out its mission in particular social and spiritual contexts. The driving force of William Booth's theology, his eschatological vision, is a fitting example and reminder to the Christian church and to the contemporary army of its eschatological task. That is the work with God, that is to work with God to redeem the world. It's this theology that has produced practical arms of service throughout the 126 countries the Salvation Army serves. It is this biblical and pragmatic theology which encourages soldiers to fight for those who are seemingly lost to society. One of William Booth's hymns, known in the Salvation Army as the Founder Song, embodies this eschatological task. O boundless salvation, deep ocean of love, the whole world redeeming, so rich, so free, now flowing for all men. Come, roll over me. I think we should just start singing. So we move to the next portion, a refreshing alternative to social work. Maybe... Maybe our bifurcating nomenclature of spiritual and social work is the source of the tension revealed in our question. Our question is, can we save souls and serve suffering humanity? I propose today an alternative paradigm to refresh the holistic ministry of the Salvation Army, and that is Christian hospitality. In Greek, the word for hospitality, philoxenos, is an invented word. It's made up. It combines two words together, the word for love, phylos, like in brotherly love, like the city of Philadelphia, and the word for stranger, xenos. Therefore, hospitality means love of stranger. The practice of hospitality finds its source 
in its highest expression in the nature of the triune God who continually welcomes humanity into the eternal fellowship of the Godhead. Such welcome is clearly exhibited through Jesus' sacrificial welcome in his passion, which is so important to the Salvationist. Receiving the welcome that Jesus offers necessitates participation in the fellowship of God's Trinitarian nature. The tradition of hospitality incorporates more than bringing desserts to a potluck or prosaic conversation among friends and family. It is not, it's not a spiritual gift. It's not listed as a spiritual gift. It's not a spiritual gift for those who like to bake. On the contrary, throughout church history, hospitality has been concerned with the interaction between others and the practice of welcoming strangers. Scripture is filled with this imagery. And if I had more time, we could, we could spend looking at all the scripture that deals with hospitality and addresses it. In Romans 12, 13, the Apostle Paul gives this two-word command. Practice hospitality. It's hard to effectively translate the force of this command in its original language. In Greek, it's as if Paul underlined, emboldened, italicized in a large font and talk, spoke with as much enthusiasm as I'm trying to do and said, you must practice hospitality. Or it could be translated, pursue hospitality. Just as one is to pursue like in a hunt or a vigorous pursuit. The word hospitality, though, has come to be associated with the hospitality industry, which we're benefiting from today, or it's become connected to conversation over coffee at someone's house. Until the last 300 years, the word hospitality was specifically understood as a Christian practice. So the root of the word hosp can be seen in words like hospital, hostel, hostess, etc. The idea was that Christians had a duty to make room for strangers. So if you use hospitality in any other context, you were talking about a Christian practice before 300 years ago. The significance of naming the tradition is important to William Booth's connection with the overarching social ethical tradition of the Christianity. The language provides the means whereby a Christian can understand his or her social responsibility within the realm of a theological, historical, and moral reflection. This understanding is specifically significant for co contemporary practitioners of hospitality because hospitality enables their service to move beyond the realm of duty, social services, or social work. Hospitality then becomes not just something we do, but a way of life for individuals and communities to express welcome as an outgrowth of, a, of their identity as a Christian body. Christian ethicist Christine Pohl shares, Reclaiming hospitality is an attempt to bring back the relational dimension to social service and to highlight concerns for empowerment and partnership with those who need assistance. Any Christian movement that takes seriously the exhortation to welcome one another, as it says in Romans 15, 7, can benefit from viewing this welcome through the lens of hospitality. The biblical and theological tradition of hospitality can serve as a refreshing theoretical paradigm for the Salvation Army ministries. One can argue that the Salvation Army has had the most consistent Christian social witness in the last 150 years. However, acknowledging, naming, and refocusing this social witness as hospitality will connect the Salvation Army's work with the theological history of the church. Theological reflection has often been a secondary concern for the pragmatic Salvation Army. Therefore, it has admittedly lacked an explicit theological, theological foundation for its practices. The theological heritage supplied by the tradition of hospitality can provide a vibrant foundation for the existing social ministries of the Army. In this way, hospitality can further connect and unite the progression of William Booth's theology in a way that does not tend towards bifurcation of social and spiritual ministries. Everywhere the Salvation Army flag flies, a localized presence of the Army's mission has inherited the fruits of William Booth's eschatologically focused theology. And if the Army looks at the coming kingdom of God as the template by which the kingdom of God is now reality, then an eschatological ethic is advantageous for the Army today. Dichotomizing this mission into distinct categories of spiritual and social mission often debilitates the army from recognizing this holistic heritage. Social services as a paradigm 
I believe, has perpetuated this dichotomy. Now, some people might throw something at me because I said that, but I think it uh, is a part of the problem. A shift in theological paradigms is an answer to this problem. The historical, biblical, theological, and moral tradition of hospitality can serve as an antidote to a sometimes bifurcated Salvation Army. So for a few practical applications, suggesting these. I'm suggesting that we fully sanctify all aspects of our ministry by refreshing our approach to serving suffering humanity through the lens of hospitality, which empowers our service to suffering humanity to save souls. A community of salvationists, employees, officers, soldiers, and the guests we serve can be engaged if we are not separated and we actualize the vision and power of one army transforming the world. Practically, we then focus our ministry around our large task of proclaiming the good news of God's reign and the opportunity to live under it by following Jesus and anticipating the holistic consequences of his kingdom. So these few five points that I have to make. One, one thing I suggest, we alter our language. Social services as a name misses the mark of the broad dimensions of our hospitable heritage. In my last appointment, the Corps changed the name of the shelter manager to the Minister of Hospitality. We ceased referring to people in our shelter as clients and began calling them our guest. These changes happened when we combined together to look at our hospitable heritage. Secondly, and this is a discussion at my, my table earlier today, resist funding streams that call for separation. Well, that could be a whole conference in itself but resist funding streams that call for separation. Three, challenge officer appointment titles and administrative structures that systematically limit one's work to the bifurcated jargon of social, field, staff, or spiritual. Remember uh, General Coots' words on this? He says, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder, right? The holistic redemptive work of the army. Fourth, Engage all groups, soldiers, employees, officers, advisory organizations, and those we serve with a holistic image that consistently calls us towards an integrated mission. This task certainly is overwhelming, but so does the task of winning the world for Jesus. But we do it with God's help. The difficulty of this task should not discourage us from undertaking it. It should encourage us to undertake it with the power of the Holy Spirit. A helpful place for us to start is to bring members of all these various groups together to present a unified vision. So those who are you know, from an American context, how many times have you had members of your advisory board, your staff, your soldiers, the people you serve in the same room presenting one vision? That's what I'm proposing here. Fifth, make opportunities for sharing the gospel a common occurrence that goes hand in hand with all of our activity. So when you open the door for someone to hear the Holy Spirit's prompting, you are practicing hospitality. Commissioner George Scott Railton, one of our early practitioners of hospitality, challenges to let the gospel sound throughout the world. Through the world resounding, let the gospel sounding, summon all at Jesus' call, his glorious cross surrounding, sons of God, earth trifles leaving, be not faithless, but believing to your conquering captain, which is not me, but Jesus, to your conquering captain, cleaving forward to the fight. Salvation Army hospitality is a missional hospitality. It's connected to God's plan to redeem the world. For the Salvationists, this plan is understood through the imagery of the battle, and it calls soldiers to move compassionately forward to the fight. God bless you. Thank you, Captain, for this inspiring uh, contribution to our conference. And we are now looking forward to the response by Major Pam Wharf from New Zealand, Fiji and Tonga Territory. Let's welcome the Major. Down. 
Captain Miller's question, paper asks the question, can we save souls while serving suffering humanity? And he gives a very exuberant but definite answer, yes. But there is a tension that exists within the Salvation Army theology and practice to the question posed. And I would suggest that this tension is good for us. It not only challenges our thinking and practice, but drives our discussions with colleagues, whether they have core or social service involvement, into ensuring the best means possible are engaged in bringing people into a relationship with God, while tackling the issues of social justice and improving the lives of those affected by injustice. I suggest this tension that Booth described is evident in the paper we have examined. Historians have written that Booth often wondered whether he had been a right to allow the army to divert its energies from the strictly evangelical responsibility of the preacher's vocation. This paper describes the bifurcation nomenclature of spiritual and social work as the source of the tension. Is it a tension still present today? In my home territory of New Zealand, this has been a topic of much discussion. We are now working on closing the gap between core and social service ministries. From the time of receiving government funding for social services, it became clear that professionalism drove the outcome of the work, shying core people away from becoming involved. We have endeavoured to address this with the majority of our community ministry centres being driven from core leadership and our addiction centres fo focusing on recovery churches. Captain Miller talks of hospitality and the call from scripture to practice hospitality. I would like to add to this by suggesting hospitality can be described as hope. Our ministries talk of hope, but what does that really mean in the context of hospitality? I suggest a model is simple, but creates a clear pathway. Hope requires skill, mastery, attachment, and faith. So if a client or person enters our centre for budgeting services, they learn budgeting skills, they get on top of that, and that's mastery, they find a real place of belonging through hospitality, and that's attachment, and wrap around that discovery of faith. Hospita hospitality is then the expression of belonging connection, part of what we do, over and above the sur surface level of a meal together. Captain Miller gives five suggestions to help soothe this tension and separation of spiritual and social mission that may be holding us back from our heritage of the evangelical, es evangelical eschatology. And I'm going to add a six for our discussion groups. What if all of our centres, core and social, were renamed mission stations? Each mission station would have as a community of faith, a pastoral care council, who worked closely alongside the social expression of the station. How would that change the way we think and the emphasis we place on mission versus social work? The vision would be the body of Christ reaching the community. Captain, uh, Catherine Booth said, if we are to better the future, we must disturb the present. What do we need to disturb to create future that brings us back to the vision of saving souls while serving suffering humanity? Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Media, for your response. Give some good, clear guidelines. Are you going to uh, adjust this, uh, Joe? Then we can uh, move on. And uh, that's why she's, she's the technical one. I'm the speaker, she's the technical one. Well, one of us has to be, it has to be you. <laughs> so uh, just remind you of the questions that you are to keep in mind. What are the challenges? What are the hopes that we hear through the papers? What are the learning points? What are the next steps? And as you will have seen, the, the tables have switched roles. The, the, those who looked at concerns this morning now look at hopes and vice versa. So, but, but keep it in mind as you read through the papers, as you listen to them and make notes so that the cons conversation can start immediately after the second presentation. It is a privilege now to introduce you to Captain Harry Heron from Singapore, Malaysia and Myanmar Territory. 
Welcome, Captain, to present your paper and give him a warm welcome. As I stand before you, allow me to give glory and honor to Jesus. Amen. Can we save souls while serving suffering humanity? I believe we serve suffering humanity because we love the souls that Christ has died for, and not because of saving sick. Only God can save souls. We are mere instruments. Let us look at Luke 17, verses 11 to 19, and the account of Jesus healing ten lepers. Did Jesus heal the ten lepers because he was evangelizing? Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into the village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at the distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Rather controversial, I say that this is not evangelism. This was compassion. A soul was saved as a result of compassion. When we serve suffering humanity, it must be the result of compassion. Love for people needs to be rooted in the master's love for humanity. There's a danger if we delink souls from humanity. In this paper, allow me to look at three key words serving suffering humanity from the context of my ministry in Singapore. Singapore was estimated to have a GDP per capita of US $56,532 in 2010. Using this measure as a basis, Singapore residents emerged as the richest people in the world. In an island state of 3.6 million population, an estimated of 157,000 to make it clearer, one in 20 of them are millionaires. Today, Singapore is commonly referred to as a Switzerland of the East. Geographically, Singapore is blessed with no natural calamities, albeit mild tremors coming from Indonesia. Its common grouch is the annual haze drifting from Sumatra. The ruling party has been governing the country since independence in 1965. There is no riots in the, in the streets. While homeland security is tight, there has been no incidence of violent terrorism in the island. Crime rates are so low that the police had ran campaigns with a tagline that says, low crime does not mean no crime. <laughs> Last green landscaping permits through the island. Home ownership is one of the highest in the world. Now, other measures on lifestyle pointing to a growing sophistication. There are more smartphones in Singapore than people. And the proportion of these device owners have mobile broadband subscriptions. Happens to be the highest in the world as well. This begs the question now, friends, amidst the growing wealth and affluence, where are the suffering humanity in Singapore? In truth, Singapore is no paradise, and the clues are telling. Despite its status as a rich nation, income equality is the highest compared to any OECD countries. The income gap is not only wide between the rich and the poor, but it is puzzling. It's a puzzling wide even between the richer and the rich. And even millionaires in Singapore probably do not perceive themselves much of a big shot amidst their neighbours who had hundreds of millions in assets. Low-income earners grabbled to make a sense of a city bustling with retail outlets, displaying items of opulence. Singaporeans are one of the fastest walkers in this planet, friends, a reflection of a pace of life. The fertility rate in Singapore is 1.20, lower than Japan with its 1.39, and significantly below the self-replacing rate of 2.1. Divorce rates are on the rise. More marriages are now being postponed, and there is a growing number of single people. 
I got to confess, I'm a single officer. <laughs> Compelling the evidence of Singapore's woes is fine in the Gallup research, if you go through, which shows Singapore to be the most emotionless and unhappy society in the world. Popular culture in Singapore is deeply inspired by cynicism, a reflection of the perpetual and consistent unhappiness in the community. While the island is populated with 5.5 million people, only 3.6 million comprises of citizens and permanent residents. A minority portion of the other 1.9 million is made up of professionals and high-income earners. The majority includes domestic helpers, construction and manufacturing workers, as well as retail service staff. Many of these migrant workers to Singapore are lured by the prospect of good income and would even surrender their entire fortune to pay for the passage and work through shrewd and profiting agents. How is it possible that a country deemed to be prosperous with no risk of violence and crime, will end up being the unhappiest. Being a country with no natural resources, Singapore was only to recognize that manpower was the only resource. Meritocracy was quickly adopted as the key principle and the philosophy in the way Singapore organizes itself. Naturally, Singapore is more than eager to benchmark its performance against those of its neighboring countries across different aspects of development and using all possible indicators. Now, this is evident given the abundance of statistics comparing Singapore and the rest of the world as quoted in this paper. The hierarchical nature of Singapore is apparent in every aspect of living. Public housing is segmented by flats with different number of rooms built with each flat. Higher income earners will live in five-room flat. The lower income earners will just live in two-room renters. For the longest time, school was publicly ranked based on academic performances, and students are streamed early in life based on their English, mathematics, science, and mother tongue language scores. Military service is mandatory in Singapore, and in the two years of service, soldiers in their late teens are ranked and sorted by different military vocations. Care are the most expensive in the world, and cars are the most expensive in the world, and any car purchase is made possible only with successful bid for a certificate of entitlement, which often amounts to tens of thousands of dollars, and it dictates the size of the car engine. Society can judge the net worth of an individual simply based on the engine size of a car. The strongest temptation that befalls a successful and hierarchical structured society is covetousness. The Tenth Commandment states, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything belongs to your neighbor. Ironically, this Tenth Commandment is probably the least preached about Singapore. Sadly, Christianity is too often associated with popular prosperity gospel churches and too often linked with uh, newsworthy financial scandals. In a landscape, high people density Singapore, competing against for a certificate of owning a car to secure a vacancy in reputable school to being considered marriageable against other male suitors based on perceived net worth induces an endless state of coveting. Scripture has long prophesied that those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money has wandered from faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Fifty years ago, Singapore was poor in economic terms, and the total population was much smaller. The Salvation Army, led by foreign officers, inspired local ones, was committed to meet the needs in whatever ways possible. To meet needs, the Salvation Army in Singapore established residential homes for children in need and the aged. Its community programs were targeted to reach out to the lower income groups. Today, Singapore's population is much more complex and the Salvation Army has earned a respectable history and a reputation for its social contributions. 
against the backdrop of this sophisticated eco economy is the support of the structured public service sector. The role of a government influences wide areas. For example, you will believe each tree in Singapore is tagged with a serial number and it is monitored for diseases and its growth, um, its growth is monitored and regulated. It is thus unsurprising that the authorities in Singapore assert its influence on the social service sector, requiring institutions such as the Salvation Army to be more accountable for the use of public donations. Yet, as a church, the Salvation Army neither grew in strength nor in influence. Thus, this has implications to its social programs. A smaller soldiery base would imply smaller number of officers recruited. Over the time, native office, Singapore officers aged and retired. Some existing officers resigned, and the number of newly commissioned officers was so low that the school for officers training eventually closed its door for a number of years. The soldiery, too, has aged over time, and in almost all of the court today, the youth made up of the minority of the folks. With a shortage of new officers, and a stagnated soldiery base, the running of the Salvation Army social program is now largely dependent on employees, many of whom who are non-Salvationists. Thus, the notion of serving suffering humanity is understood and interpreted differently by these employees, and not necessarily in the same way as understood based on the values and the context of Salvationism. With the growing influence of non-Salvation Army values guiding the social program, the dwindling count of Salvation Army officers, and the higher accountability imposed by the state, the Salvation Army in Singapore eventually settled on its legacy structures and network of centers with key operational decision-making functions left to the interpretation of the non-Salvationist professionals and workers. Today, the program of Salvation Army in Singapore addresses the issue of a small segment of the resident population with several outreach programs catered to foreign nurses, while a plight of those ministered by the Salvation Army in Singapore seems to suggest a state of suffering given their relatively difficult economy and social circumstances, their plight is not represented of the magnitude of the suffering faced by the community at large. As I've explained, Singapore society is pierced with many grief, riddled with anxieties, hardened with cynicism, and confronted with self-seeking peer pressures. The Salvation Army, given its long tradition in addressing the needs of the poor, economically poor, is less adept to the work of exposing the spiritual bondage of affluence and preaching a gospel that promises spiritual freedom. At the core, the suffering of Singapore is a spiritual one. Service is called to the heartbeat of the Salvation Army movement. While most large contemporary churches are strive to appeal to its congregation in a fashion aligned with consumerism, feel good experiences, bright lights and sounds, emotional sermons, great music, etc., the Salvation Army has a culture rooted on salvationism, which is ism, I-S-M, a way of life, community, culture, and value system. Salvationists are taught in the onset that they were saved to serve, not consuming, is how a salvationist should grow to be like Jesus. The attitude must include our social services. A sense of ownership of the social services ministry ought to exist to those who vow to defend salvationism and what the Salvation Army stands for. In short, serving suffering humanity is first a spiritual burden of the soldiers of the Salvation Army. It is possibly the professional burden of the employees, but the spiritual ownership has to be with the soldiery. By soldiery, it should not be limited to the soldiers of a particular corps, but it has to be tied up to a specific program of the social centers. Rather, the burden should be borne by a general sense of ownership of all social services uh, ministry by all soldiers. Having such a stakeholder model will require representative Salvation Army headquarters to ensure all call to regularly arrange visits and engagement of core folks in various social centers. 
Serving is a church culture of the Salvation Army movement. Now, Reverend Timothy Keller of the Redeemer Church describes a movement as word <clears throat> marked by an attractive, clear, unifying vision for the future. It is held together with a strong sense of values or beliefs. The content of the vision must be compelling and clear so that others can grasp it readily. It must not be difficult that only a handful of people can articulate it. Instead, it must be something that all members of the movement can understand and pass virally to others. By contrast, institutionalized organizations are held together by rules and regulations and procedures, not by a shared vision. And finally, a loving army, a soul-loving army. Despite the challenges and difficulties faced by the Salvation Army in Singapore, the question of Jesus to Peter, I'm sorry, it shouldn't be John, it should be Peter, but nevertheless, you can put your name as well, because Jesus is speaking to us today. And he says, do you love me? If so, feed my lambs. No soldiers can claim that he has the power to save souls, only God saves. We are but the barrier of good news. In this respect, I believe that having souls saved is not in question, but to reorientate a soldier's attitude and understanding in serving suffering humanity. To hold the word of God by his thoughts, his words, and his deeds, so that people may be drawn to Christ by the exemplary character. Amongst the others, they should live out the two greatest commandments of God. Love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Look through Deuteronomy and Luke and you will know it. Yes, it is imperative that we love our Almighty wholeheartedly, unreservedly, and completely. Our love for our Creator must correspond with the God-given task to love souls as indicated by the second commandment. When we realize truly and internalize fully the extent of Christ's sacrificial and redemptive love for souls, we will be most willing to be effective in serving for the good of humanity. I strongly conclude that the foregoing are not merely quotations, but they are theological truth, which are tested, proven again and again. Surely we can read or hear testimonies of the amazing conversions of men and women who repented and found new hope and purpose in Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Captain, for this inspiring paper. So uh, alternative to what we usually read. So thank you very much. It was very inspiring. And uh, we look forward to the response of Major Eleanor Haddock, who comes to us from Kenya West Territory. Welcome. Thank you. Give her a hand. Uh, good afternoon. I concur with Captain Haran in most of his paper, and in particular where he states that only God can save souls. We are merely his instruments. However, I do not entirely agree with his explanation of Luke 17, verses 11 to 19, that Jesus' motives were the result of compassion and not evangelism. Jesus' main aim in coming into the world was to reconcile mankind with their God. And as part of that, his mission was to preach the good news to the poor. If that's not evangelism, I don't know what is. The basic fundamental mission of the Salvation Army has, and always will be, the saving of souls. And that entails saving so suffering humanity. It's not the reason we are, is that not the reason we were raised up, and the reason we are effective as an army of salvation? As God's instrument, no matter where in the world we are, everything we do is evangelism based. Otherwise, we'd just become another NGO and not the faith-based Holy Spirit in this church that we are today. Our, motives is, our motive is the winning of souls for the kingdom. And as Captain stated, service is the core of the heartbeat of the Salvation Army movement. We should be all about saving souls, whether it be from the pulpit to the, or the gutter. William Booth said, nobody gets blessed if they have cold feet, and nobody gets saved if they have a toothache. 
Compassion for our fellow human beings is a driving force, of course it is. But even the old unsaved have compassion. Perhaps it has been our compassion in saving suffering humanity and the need to do something with regards to funding in particular that can lead the Salvation Army away from its mission and be influenced by secular society rather than by the Holy Spirit. I concur with the captain when he states a sense of ownership of the social service ministry ought to exist. Too often we are guilty of dividing the Salvation Army in two, when we should be interlinked. One, the church, and two, our social work. Faith and work should travel side by side, step answering step, like the legs of a man walking, first faith and then works, then faith again, and then works again, until they can be scarcely distinguished which is one and which is the other. But until we manifest God's love in action, our words are nothing but sounding brass or clinkling cymbal. These are words of William Booth. As disciples of Jesus Christ and as an army of salvation, we have been blessed with a social conscience that reflects the spiritual realities of Jesus who was sent to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover the sight for the blind and release the oppressed. Luke 4, 31 to 44. A simple answer to the question is yes. No matter where in the world the army is called to be, we can save souls while serving suffering humanity. If we follow God's guidance through scripture and the, and the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we need to be careful when accepting assistance from the secular world and do not compromise ourselves out of the kingdom. William Booth stated, we must wake ourselves up or someone else will take our place and bear our cross and thereby rob us of our crown. And, sincere, and since scripture states that the poor we will have with us always, whether in Kenya, Singapore, or where God has placed us, then there will always be a mission for the Salvation Army to save souls while serving suffering humanity until Christ comes or calls. Thank you. Thank you very much, Media, for this response. I think it's some excellent papers we've had this afternoon. And now we move into the group discussions. We are very uh, grateful to our facilitators around the tables and also to the recorders. We are one recorder short. Uh, would there be a volunteer recorder in the room? Which room is short? Table 7 is short. Table 7 is short. Is there a volunteer at the table? Or do we have two recorders at one table as we had this morning? No. Is there uh, somebody who could volunteer for? Okay, thank you. There is a volunteer over there. That's great. Thank you. So uh, you move on to your questions and make sure you deal with the right ones and that you move on fast from the first question to the second and third question. And to the people who, uh, in the back, you can either form a discussion group yourself uh, you will have a piece of paper. I think that's a good idea if you want to be part of a discussion. You can form a discussion group yourself and you're welcome to hand in any notes, any learning points that you want to share with the rest of the group. So thank you very much. And if, if it's not a whole group, you can join the tables one by one. Thank you.